Good morning, good morning, everyone. Had to go back and uh, get myself another cup of Java. Boy, I tell you what, um, I do like my coffee. Uh, here it is, you know, I, I, got, I, get, I got to the office this morning right at 4 o'clock, and um, <clears throat> I was out of coffee. Oh, I, uh, so I had to, had, to, had to get some coffee. That's all there is to it, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, yeah, for those of you who have asked, yes, Kona a Hawaiian blend is currently my favorite. I love Javalia. And some of you have been very kind enough to send me samples of different coffees from different regions and what have you. And I really appreciate that. I honestly do. Uh, but I keep coming back to Kona. It's just so smooth. And I love Javalia. It's almost as smooth. So I kind of alternate between them from time to time. But, hey, you know what? If you got a favorite blend, you want to send me a, a sample of it, go for it. <laughs> All right. Well, we are continuing our discussion uh, of, uh, uh, by the way, uh, my name is Don Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma, and this is Morning Musings. <laughs> uh, so anyway, we are continuing our discussion of Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away but my words will never pass away. I've already shared with you for a couple of videos now how important it is to see what Jesus said, the la very last part of that verse. You know, people latch onto the very first part of it and they say, ah, oh, Jesus said heaven and earth will pass away. He must be talking about physical creation. No, if the last part of the verse is applicable, and of course it is, and he said, my words will never pass away. That means that Jesus' gospel, the preaching of the gospel to men for the salvation from sin will never cease. Uh, I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. That's the meaning of that text as I've shared with you over and over again. So as promised yesterday, I want to begin an examination of how Jesus, in Matthew 24, was acting as the part of a good, faithful Jewish prophet in predicting the downfall of the, of the city and the temple. Now, I'm going to be sharing with you some comments uh, from Josephus a little bit later on, all right, uh, that will, if you're not familiar with them, they're going to blow you away, I'll guarantee you. But, what I want to do is to show how Jesus, acting as a good prophet of Israel, in the language that he used, was being perfectly consistent with the Old Testament language, Old Testament usage of the language of the passing of heaven and earth. Because what that suggests is this. If Jesus was using the language of the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, who used apocalyptic, metaphoric, figurative, non-literal language to describe and to predict the coming destruction of a city, a kingdom, a nation. And if Jesus was using that language in the same way, then that would suggest all but demand that Jesus was using the language of the passing of heaven and earth metaphorically, figuratively, figuratively hyperbolically, non-literally. With that hermeneutical principle before us, let's go to Isaiah chapter 13. In Isaiah 13, we are told in the first two verses, the burden against Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. We know who this prophecy is about. It is about ancient Babylon. Lift up a banner on the high mountain, raise your voice to them, wave your hand that they may enter the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for my anger, those who rejoice in my exultation. And it begins to describe a destruction that is coming. Now watch verse 6. Wail for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will be limp, every man's heart will melt. They will be afraid. Pangs and sorrows will take hold of them. Hey, listen, folks, this is the language of the birth pangs of Messiah, or the birth pangs. The, the language of birth pangs is a very, very common motif to speak of a time of difficulty, of distress, 
and tribulation. And in messianic expectation, the Jews believed that in the last generation, there would be a time of great tribulation that would lead directly to the day of the Lord, the judgment, the resurrection, and the kingdom. Well, that language of difficulty, of tribulation and strife before the end, so to speak, is based upon texts like this. Look at it. Pangs and sorrows will take hold of them. They will be in pain as a woman in childbirth. This is talking about the distress of Babylon before her destruction. But to continue, verse 9, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. Now watch this. Listen to this. Catch the power of this. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. Hmm. Where have we read language like that? Oh, I know. Matthew 24, 30. The sun will be darkened in its going forth. Huh. Where have we read language like that? The moon will not cause its light to shine. Whoa! Yeah. This is the same language as Matthew 24, 30, 29 and 30. It's the day of the Lord when heaven and earth would be destroyed, but it was the prediction of the destruction of Babylon. It's not the destruction of the in, uh, that would take place at the end of time. It is not a prediction of the end of time. It is not a prediction of the destruction of the Babylon of Revelation. Oh, and I know that because, number one, it was at hand. And by the way, within 15 years, even as Thomas Ice and other dispensationalists admit, Walvert and, and, and Zook in their book, Bible uh, Commentary, Bible Knowledge Commentary, excuse me, admit that within 15 years Babylon was destroyed and sacked by the Assyrians. Then there is an extended discuss, discussion later on in verse 17 uh, of the final destruction of Babylon at the hands of the Medes and the Persians. Well, that means it's not talking about Babylon of Revelation. The Medes and the Persians don't exist today. And, and by the way, let, let me make this observation because this is so critical. I have people take note and they argue with me uh, and other preterists, obviously. And they say, well, you know, it says in Isaiah 13 and 14 that Babylon would fall and never rise again. Well, look, Nebuchadnezzar started, Nebuchadnezzar, <laughs> Saddam Hussein tried to rebuild Babylon. Well, it sort of kind of got interrupted, didn't it? Well, anyway, the point of fact is many people get so hung up on the language of, for instance, do you not see all of these things? The time is coming in which not one stone shall be left standing on top of another. And I've had people tell me, well, look, the western wall of the temple, western wall of Jerusalem is still standing. Not one stone that hasn't been fulfilled. And that imposes such an incredibly wooden, harsh rigid literalism on the text that is absolutely not even close to the Hebraic use of language. The focus is on the kingdom that those, temp that those buildings represented. When the kingdom of Babylon ceased to exist, it's the same as if every stone was cast down. Now, was the city destroyed? Absolutely. But must we look for, uh, uh, must we go there with an architect, with a building examiner and say, oh, 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 oh look, there's one building, uh, uh, I see one stone left standing on top of another. Oh, hadn't been fulfilled. We have to be better Bible students than that, don't we? Yes, we do. So here we have in Isaiah chapter 13, the prediction 
of the destruction of historical Babylon. It is described <clears throat> as the destruction of heaven and earth and as a host of biblical commentators have noted the language of verse 10 is the language of Matthew 24, 29, and 30. They're talking about two totally distinct separate events using the same language. Now, since they're using the same language of two totally distinct events that virtually demands that the language that is being used is just common prophetic language. It's the vernacular of the prophets and was never intended to be taken literally. And we got more to verify that. And by the way, don't forget, in my book, The Elements Shall Melt with Fervent Heat, I do discuss Isaiah 13 extensively. I also uh, discuss Isaiah 24 and 25 extensively. And that's where we're going on the flip side. So I'll see you there. But go to my website, donkpreston.com, BibleProphecy.com. Go to the store, order the book. Send me a note that says you saw the offer on YouTube or Facebook, and I'll refund your shipping, saving you $5. Okay, I'll see you on the flip side.